Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is New York City in the year 1905. It's the Lower East Side. And it stands as a representation of urban life before the car was actually introduced into our cities. This is the way we used to live in our cities. This is where life happened. It happened on the streets. We were not able to live outside of the city. We had to live where we work. And that's how most of the cities actually looked at the beginning of the last century. Now, we fast forward eight years. And the same city, very close by street, Fifth Avenue, looks like this. What has happened in between? Ford invented its Model T, the first mass-produced car. And people were actually able to afford it in masses. And so, within eight years, the way how we moved around in our cities changed drastically. Of course, Ford didn't invent that car in order to change the face of our cities. It invented the car to, well, bring more, a more comfortable life to people. But what it did to our cities is that, all of a sudden, we were not we, we didn't need to live where we work. We were able to move out of the city. We were able to create urban sprawl. And so a technological in innovation actually decided how our cities look today. This is a part of Long Island, how it looks today. It's a very, you, you, you find these type of images on Google Maps in nearly every city in the world. And Living like this is nearly impossible without having a car. So the technological innovation at the beginning of the last century actually decided on how much fossil fuel, how much time, how much ener energy we spend today on commuting, but even how much of the energy we, we need to spend for heating our homes and for, well, supplying our cities and moving goods and stuff around. So. Other technological innovations have happened in the past with tremendous impact on our cities. One of the most recent ones being the smartphone, right? Most of you have one. And I today, I cannot imagine how I, you know, how I, how I was able to move around in cities without Google Maps or the other wayfinding apps. Um, the full impact of the smartphone on the cities is yet still to be seen. but. The point I'm, I'm making is that technologies invented in the conventional way are targeted at individual consumers. They're not targeted at our cities. And the way how cities have developed in the past is just a side effect of the technological innovation. Why is that important? Well, cities today represent a, one of the largest parts of our global economy and represent one of the biggest impacts that we assert on our planet. Although it's only 2% of global surface that covers cities, already more than 50% of all people live in cities. More than two-thirds of the global emissions come out of cities. More than 70% of global energy consumption happens in cities. And of course, the largest part of w production of wealth and prosperity happens in cities. So this gives you an impression of the importance of the role of cities when it comes to defining the transition that lies ahead of us. And we all know that transition has to happen. We've given ourselves very ambitious goals, and we need to keep them. We want to reduce carbon emissions by more than 90% until the year 2050. We want to have zero fossil-fueled cars in our cities by 2050. And at least in Germany, we want to have that in one single integrated market for energy and for digital services. We cannot afford to develop and innovate technologies the way we did in the, in the past and have cities evolve as a byproduct of technological innovation. We have to actually develop technologies for our cities. And that requires a tremendous shift in paradigm of our innovation system. Let me show you in a couple of examples what I mean. 
We started with the example of mobility. This is uh, a very current example of mobility. I think most of us would agree to say this is quite a fancy car. Tesla is, is a fancy electric vehicle. However, it's not a smart urban solution. It's not a smart urban system. It's just a car that runs on electricity. To make it a smart urban solution, we would need to connect hundreds or thousands of Teslas, make them available to be shared in the city so that people would be able to book them, to share them, to share rides, so that actually less cars would be needed for more people. In that case, a Tesla would be a smart urban technology. The same accounts, for example, for autonomous vehicles. Every large automotive car company, car producer, is at the moment developing and experimenting autonomous vehicles. But an autonomous vehicle, the way maybe, you know, let's say BMW imagines it, is maybe not the way it would make sense for a city. It's just a way that saves us time or we spend time in, a, in an autonomous vehicle with doing other stuff while riding to work. Autonomous vehicles have the potential if we connect them, if we share them, if we integrate them into public transportation to save parking spaces, to save time, and to save lots of fossil fuel in our cities to bring a seamless, efficient, and integrated urban mobility. Connecting them makes it a smart solution. Let's shift to a different example. Cities are not only about transportation, they're also about living. And in a city, everything is connected, how we live, how we work, how we commute. This is an example of a, a so-called plus energy house. Already with the technologies that we possess today, we can build houses that produce more energy than they consume. By putting solar panels on the roof, by putting battery storage into the basement, by charging our own electric vehicle, we can actually produce more energy with individual houses than we consume. Although this is, this is great, it's sustainable, it's nice, it's not a smart urban solution. It may become a smart urban solution if we think about what, not one building, but an in a connected system of buildings within the city, having very different and distinct energetic profiles. Think about, for example, of a stadium. If your favorite football team plays, the stadium has high energy costs because of the floodlights, right? So this massive amount of energy makes it affordable, usually, for a football club to invest into a battery storage system that does peak load shaving. So the, the high peak of the energy gets shaved through a lithium-ion battery. But what, what, what does that battery do when the football club isn't playing? It's there and it can be used, for example, for district. So imagine all the houses around the stadium opening up their rooftops so everyone can invest into photovoltaic. And the battery storage of the district being opened up so everyone can store his or her pr renewable produced energy in the district energy storage system and d then decide whether or not to use it personally or to feed it into the grid when prices are high. Then it becomes a smart urban system. Another important part of our cities is lighting. Cities spend over 50% of their energy budget on streetlights. Cities spend this is, well, over 10% over of their actual municipal budget goes into street lighting. So it's quite a massive thing. Now, changing the existing street lights into LED street, street lights is of course something that makes a lot of sense. But it's not a smart urban solution. Street lights can do so much more. They can help monitor traffic and optimize traffic. They can help find parking spaces. They can help monitoring and improving air quality. They can help providing free Wi-Fi. They can help providing charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. They can even provide a connectivity backbone for the future internet, which is going to be run on 5G. So if we consider 
streetlights and an investment into streetlights a smart thing, then we should also think about all the other functions that streetlights can perform. So these are just some examples, some techno technology-driven examples of how we might be able to create smarter, more livable, more sustainable cities. But what is different here? What is, what is the different thing? What is new here? Well, the conventional way of innovation, the, the way that most startups get trained today still, is very direct, right? It's B2C, it's business to customer. You think about a product, an MVP, and this you try to sell to an end customer and solve some problem for your end customer. If we think about a city, a city is not about individual end customers. A city is about a collective. Why is that? In a, in a city, thousands of individual purchase decisions add up to a collective behavior. And that collective behavior has a tremendous impact on the city. So if we want to innovate for a city, it's not enough to just think about one individual end customer. We have to think about the collective and the city as a system. That makes it so hard to innovate for the smart city. And we've heard it, it's, it's a highly complex issue, as you were saying in the beginning. So I call it the business to city to ci citizen market. So the B to C square. The interesting thing here, and this is, really, this is really important, is that if we innovate for, for cities in that market, it's not enough to think about the value that your product produces for individual customers. You have to think about the, the, the value that your system provides to the city, to a collective. Therefore, the business in the smart city is just the other side of the coin of the value that you create for society. And I think this is something very important to take away. So therefore, I would suggest it, let's not call it B2C, let's call it V2C square, value to cities to citizens. There is quite an important figure because it's not enough just to innovate. We, ha we also have to reach scale. In the past, we have created lots of living labs in Europe. Living labs are the ways to create new innovations for cities, to test and try innovation at the interface of the public sector, the private sector, citizens and research. You have to bring them together into a living laboratory, into a real-world situation in your city and make them try out new things. This is how you, this is how you cope with the comp complexity, right? You have to put, install something in your city and then see what happens, measure that. If it's good, then scale it up. If it's not good, dump it, try something else. That's the way how we work when we innovate for cities. For companies, this means quite a shift, but also for cities, this means quite a shift and we have to bring them together to innovate together. So in the past, we've created, with support of the European Commission and many, many other public funds, hundreds of living labs in Europe, across Europe. There's hundreds of good innovations and interventions in our cities. And some of the stuff I just showed you is part of that. Now, it takes 40 years for them to be scaled to only 1% of all cities. And this is just not fast enough. We need to scale. So we need to think beyond innovation. We need to also think about scalability and replicability of our urban solutions. Now, how do we do that? Right? How do we do that? We need to come to a situation where we conceive and describe what is happening in all of those cities, the living labs, not as individual interventions, but as part of something bigger, as use cases of a more bigger picture of aggregated solutions. So what we are doing at the moment is we are trying to think Lego when it's about creating smart cities. Right? You have to choose the platform you need to build your smart city on, but then you can innovate and try out with thousands of pieces that are interoperable, that match, that can communicate. And then you need ready-defined 
predetermined kits to roll this innovation out in your city, like construction manuals. So we've created a global community because this is a task for a global community that runs this approach and collects on a global level use cases and living labs and interventions, good stories from cities from all over the world and brings them into a neutral solution architecture so that companies can attach their products to it and we can also define requirements for products. And cities can take a construction manual and take a couple of easy steps to implement what worked somewhere else also in, in the own city. As an example, think, think for example of the city of Bonn, right? We know in Bonn we have high emissions from transportation. It was all over the news. So by looking at predefined solution architectures, we would find something like a solution which could be called sustainable district logistics. And we would see that Manchester has tried out a inner city electric cargo bike system as, and has taken out all the cars from its city centre from Oxford Road, one of the most polluted roads in all over Europe. And we might find a local provider of cargo bikes. And we bring this together with the city over three simple steps into an individual application in Bonn, which could be called the CO2 neutral distribution system for the city centre of Bonn. So this is a global effort that we need to make to reach scale and mass. And I invite you to grow this community with all of us so that in the future we can come from 40 years to reach only 1% of all cities to 10 years to reach at least more than 10% of all cities. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.